thanks everyone for joining. Um, obviously, we wanted to keep our community going through the period of disruption. So very glad that you could join us today and um, give us some benefit of the doubt, depending on what happens, because this is the first time we've done this together. So assume that you're all meeting in person and eating Monster Munch at the moment. I have mine oh, ready. I brought some um, cheap Christmas cake. Oh, I've got some mini, there's, Hayden's got mini cheddars, there's hula hoops <laughs> going on. Um, we all came prepared, I'm pleased to see. Uh, I think it will be quite nice if, if it's okay with everybody to just, um, just go around, see who's on the call. Um, I'll start with myself, I'm Liam, I'm the chair of the renovation group. I'm currently in Nine Elms in the middle of London. Marcus oh, Mayers, uh, just because I thought, sort of, well, my screen's next to yours, and I don't know that. Uh, currently in Blackheath in South London in my sauna like shed. <laughs> I'm Johanna nice. Randall, pretending to be in Dubrovnik but really in Brighton. I'm Freddie Torberg in South London. Uh, Jonathan Brown in Brighton. Um, and, uh, Technical and innovation lead for Ricardo. And um, Sadi and Yuja, and uh, I'm also in London. I'm Anna Mordo from Hitachi Rail, and I'm at my station, as you can see. Obviously, not at my station. Oh, yeah. It's my <laughs> local station in South London, so in Blackheath. I think of someone else from Blackheath. You're making an essential journey. <laughs> I'm making virtual journeys, I wish. <laughs> Hey Wayne. Um, so I think uh, if there's Andy here, Andy Houghton, yeah. where are you? Yeah, so um, Andy Houghton from Wi-Fi Spark, and I'm currently sat in what until a week ago was the utility room um, at my <laughs> partner's house, which is now a um, multiple um, desk office with more IT hardware in it than I could work to mention, and we've got children just outside the door doing homework, which is going so well, <laughs> so well. <laughs> and it rained yesterday, so we can't even throw them outside um, to run off some calories. Uh, Peter, Peter Hicks. Uh, Peter Hicks, Director of Open Train Times in, I don't know where this image behind me is from, but I'm in sunny North London in Archway. Oh, you uh, might Emily? Jumping up in the video. <laughs> Cool. Hi, I'm Emily. Uh, I'm just outside Bristol at the moment, currently hiding upstairs from my hordes of hungry children who have got till one o'clock to keep it quiet. <laughs> <laughs> We've got Paul Costa. Yeah, hi there. Um, Paul, I'm in Tooting at the moment, uh, co-founder of Modal, a technology company in the rail space. Uh, Hayden? Afternoon, Hayden Sutherland, um, founder and chair of the Open Transport Initiative. Um, I'm, I'm from uh, live outside Glasgow, although I don't sound it. What else we got? We've got uh, Freddie. Um, Freddie Tullberg from a business called MSOL. Um, it's a focus on air quality monitoring, predominantly in the station side, as well as on some of the construction and activity in rail. Uh, Craig. Hello, Craig, you're on um, Craig Tompkins from uh, DNA, uh, head of transport there. Um, so we work on design and innovation projects uh, with lots of talks. Um, and I'm really interested to hear about the challenges that everyone's facing at the moment. You got Liam Purcell. Hi, it's Liam from uh, Ricardo Rail, and I'm in Derbyshire. We got Wayne. Morning, everybody. Hi, Wayne Marks Butler from CCD Design and Ergonomics. Um, hey, Wayne. Hi, how are you doing, everyone? I'm good, but I'm disappointed I can't smell you because you always smell so nice. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> Too much information. <laughs> he does. He has a lovely. He has a lovely choice of aftershave. <laughs> Get, I understand I'm about to get my nails painted by my six-year-old son as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, not now, Gabriel, though, please. I'm just on a call. <laughs> uh, Paul Coleman. 
Hi, yeah, Paul Coleman, a uh, transport consultant at CACI, um, and I am in sunny Guildford today. Cheers. Uh, Tom McLaughlin. Hi, uh, yeah, Tom McLaughlin. I'm uh, from First Group. I'm, or I'm currently head of business planning at the West Coast Partnership franchise, uh, and I'm here in Kensal Rise, Northwest London. Cool. We got Chris Jones. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm a project sponsor at the Department of Transport. Um, currently in my friend's flat because my usual flatmate panicked about me returning from Japan and maybe giving him the disease. So here we are. Uh, Dave Sampson. Hi, I'm Tax Trends and uh, we look at uh, how to apply advanced applications um, on uh, Wi-Fi systems. Uh, Niels. Hi, my name is Niels. Uh, I'm calling you guys from Belgium uh, again. Um, I'm co-founder of OTIV and we developed a software that uh, significantly increases safety of uh, railway vehicles, uh, more specifically in complex environments. So we're talking about trams that drive through cities and uh, trains that drive on industrial sites. Thank you. Uh, Jack? Hi, I'm Jack. I'm a marketing representative for Junction. We build and develop uh, apps for the rail industry to help manage disruption and things like that. You might know my colleague Robin or Emily or Mike Lloyd. Yes, we do. Yep, yeah, yep. they might join later on. Perfect. Um, we've got uh, Joshua. Hi, hi. I'm Joshua Yap. Um, I'm a project engineer for Network Rail based in uh, London Stratford, currently uh, living in Red Hill. Perfect. Uh, ben Vallely. Hi guys, uh, Ben Vallely. I uh, work for CPC uh, Systems as a project engineer, um, currently working on Crossrail and 4LM, though doing it from the beauties of my study in West Sussex. <laughs> uh, Christos. Oh, I've got Hello, I haven't well. done my video on. Hi everyone, I'm Christos. I'm a consultant at Arcadis. I've also got Juliana here with me, Juliana Motes, who's an engineer at WSP. And we are at home in London making lunch and learning about trains. Perfect. Uh, Jenny Cook. Hello there. Uh I was just checking I wasn't on mute because that's what usually happens on these sorts of occasions. Uh, but I'm a senior project engineer in the same team as Josh Yap. Perfect. And uh, Mark, but without a second name. Oh, sorry, it's Mark Petman from LNER. Hello. Hiya. Hi, sorry. Mark. Hiya. Uh, yeah, so I'm innovation manager at LNER. Um, I'm currently at home in London, South London, which is where I live, and I'm the I'm the furthest point away from my Wi-Fi router, so if I put the video on, it'll crash. So, um, yeah, I'll stay. I'll stay on. Think... Perfect. Uh, was that everybody then? Have I missed anyone? Me. Who's me? Yes, Lorna. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Hi, Lorna. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be able to be on the call for about half an hour. I've got um, a couple of government calls I need to take at quarter two, so I send my apologies now. Lorna, just right, so you, you got know, your... Your, your name's coming up as Hitachi's iPhone. Of course, my <laughs> new icon. That's what I actually cool. look like when I'm not at work. <laughs> right, uh, let's start then. Thank you very much. Um, and hopefully everyone now knows who else is on the call and in the community. We plan to do these uh, at least once a week, hopefully twice a week. Um, we have one probably in the diary for Friday if we can secure the speaker. So the first one is more of an open conversation. Going forward, we're trying again, going to try and get a specific speaker for each one of them. But we wanted to get your views today as to what the best thing that we can do to help us all through this process. So the agenda today, uh, could you go to the next slide? Yes. Thanks. Um, Obviously, introductions, we've done it. Uh, how is the industry reacting to the current situation? Um, I think we all know that it's been a bit of a trying to just, just keep operations running, but obviously react to lots of staffing issues. So there are some people from TOX on the line, which is very good. Obviously, in terms of us as people trying to help new 
uh, products and services and cultures into the railway. The, the, whatever leads to the franchise, whatever happens with the franchises is, is very important to us. So we're gonna discuss that in a minute. Um, then I, we have a bit of an open time for your concerns and what you need from the group and what you'd find helpful. And then lastly is we wanted to raise whether it was useful to have some sort of skills slash resources. If you have a bit of downtime, uh, what do we need? Uh, can we try and match you up with someone else in the group who can help whilst we're all sitting at home? So I think I'm now going to hand over to Marcus to do the... Hello? Oh. Um, I'm going to hand over to Marcus, but it is, it is an open conversation, so do uh, either send something in the chat to us if you have a question, or just jump in if you have something to contribute. Hi everybody, um, so I'm Marcus. Um, I've been talking to a, a range of people who I know. Um, a bit nervous talking about this subject um, when you've got people who are potentially more in the know than me. Um, but I just wanted to, for this bit, talk about what's happening with the franchises, because as we all know, um, the government has effectively taken control of the franchises. So there's been a lot of conversation going around in the last few weeks. Well, what does this mean? Does it mean network rail are in charge of everything? Um, and how does that change procurement? Uh, and, and the simple answer to this uh, for the people I've talked about is currently nothing's changed. And in all probability, nothing will change from a procurement perspective uh, ever or if for some time, because as we already know, there's two TOCs which are run uh, as government franchises. Uh, and they still have a commercial relationship with Network Rail. Because what's happened is DF, DFT are using their commercial relationship with the TOX to effectively pay on a cost plus basis. Some may be uh, effectively nationalised in the way that Northern was, um, and others will just be run uh, as contracts. So they still have their relationships with Network Rail. Uh, Network Rail is still their contractor to all intents and purposes. Um, so whilst things have happened, like the um, delay punctuality uh, requirements may have uh, somewhat um, gone away, um, the reality is the commercial setup is still the same. There isn't, Network Rail is now not responsible for the talks. They're still doing their own thing. And it, it, in doing my rounds, quite a lot of people saying, oh, well, it's all nationalised now. So, well, well, yes, sort of. Um, so I think the key thing from my perspective is, your existing relationships uh, with TOCs remain the same. They'll have different drivers because of the nature of what they're doing. We'll come on to some of these later. Um, but don't think there's now just one place you can go to sell something or to solve a problem or everyone's going to start working together collaboratively. Um, that's a larger cultural piece that will take an awfully long time. Um, and, and that's all I had to say. And I really wanted to open up the floor for people to add anything they know on the subject or any questions that they've I think Jenny got. has she sent a message to us. Yeah, I'm just reading that. Andrew Haynes is a meeting in DFT to discuss what support the relatives can provide in fighting the virus, e.g. ambulance trains or getting PPE medical supplies where they're needed. Thank you. Um I'm I might have an update on that later on in the week mm -hmm. on Friday. I'm like, I don't know whether um Lorna has anything to say about I don't know whether she's that's why she's got some government calls later but certainly I'll be on a call probably on Friday where there'll be some updates on that so we can follow that one up if there isn't going to be anything on that I think the only the only um dialogue I've had um personally um Anna you might want to jump in here is with Louise Cheeseman at Hull Trains obviously they're under a direct award so their situation is very different or be a part of the first group. So really my, my conversations with Louise have just been about reaching out and looking at what Hitachi can do to support the business moving forward, uh, maintenance, depot requirements, etc. Am I right that um, rolling stock requires quite a lot of looking after if it's not in use? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it does. Um, and obviously, um, you know, it, it, it won't come as a surprise to many to, to, to know that there's, there's monetary value as well in these maintenance contracts. So how do you commercially readjust the, the contracts in, in, a, in, a, in a climate such as, as the one that we find ourselves in? Um, so it's, it's a very, um, 
we find ourselves in a very unique and untried um, situation, really. And I, and I guess many of us are feeling the pain in different ways than we'd ever expected to. So, yeah, we do still need to maintain and they do still need to be ran. Um, and there's, there's broader implications for the depots and the depot teams as well. Yeah, um, and again, if you look at that, there's an upturn in uh, demand for vehicle storage in the off-lease market or the yet-to-be-bought-into-service market. So when you look at the industry, whilst there's problems, there's also opportunities. Yeah. <clears throat> And oh yeah, so Marcus, when you say there are opportunities, can you just for the for the people who are probably less familiar with how you stable trains and what you need to do with them when they're not in service? Right. So as an example, Bombardier have a production line which is going to shut down on Monday, um, but they produce vehicles that then go to Old Dalby for testing, and they have to run so many miles before they're then taken into service. If you think about that supply chain. What you've got is um, you need to train drivers as well. So because drivers aren't being trained in this situation, even if they were being tested before they were brought into service, there'd be no one to drive the train, so they can't be brought into service. E and to a certain extent, they can't be tested because testing has been halted because the drivers are needed to run the services. Okay. So you now have um, more requirement for storing vehicles between manufacture and testing and between testing and going into service. So you've created two new bottlenecks, which lead to an uh, increased demand for storage. Yeah. Uh, and we, are, we already had problems with storage anyway. Yeah. So the reason I say that is when we look at our existing businesses, what you'll find is for every problem, there needs to be a solution. And But one of the issues we always come up about is being allowed to use trains to test things and products on trains because they'd have to be taken out of service to be worked on or for safety or anything else. But does this provide an opportunity that there's far more safe environments to test no. potential new products? No, No, because everyone is banned. These sites are now in complete lockdown to minimise the chance of their staff getting uh, COVID because uh, there's still graffiti artists and the like who can get paid a king's ransom for tagging a train. So the only people allowed on site, as far as I'm aware, for two of these sites at least, are critical staff. All non-critical staff are not allowed on site. Right. Okay. Sadly, but the opportunity there is you have a range of managers with less to do who have got time to talk about potentially doing this after it's all over. So there's more bandwidth for management in certain parts of the industry. So how would we access that bandwidth? So that's a good question. Um, um, I, I was on a webinar with Ensol on Friday where we had a stupendous turnout because you had a lot of people sat at home uh, wanting to have discussions like this, if nothing else, to break up the day. So by running uh, webinars around your topic and how you think you can help in this situation, then I think there's an opportunity to engage with people. Okay, so that's potentially a action for us is to, uh, if anyone is on the line who wants to talk about a product they have and they want to engage with people, then probably email or message us and we'll try and see if we can do a conversation around that uh, particular topic or item. Sound good? So, um, I'm not sure what's happening here. Uh, I'm not in control of the screen, just in case anybody wonders. Okay, right, Johanna okay. I was just putting the agenda Queen back of up. the screen. Sorry, I was putting the agenda <laughs> back up because I thought perhaps in terms of just that initial update, we'd kind of got to the end of that topic. So, so I didn't know whether we wanted to go on to the next subject before we got into the heart of the matter. I don't, unless you wanted to start asking some of your, your questions now, Liam. No, I'm happy yeah. to listen more. Okay. No, so so I'm part munching of and learning, so. munching and learning. So part of what we were going to try and do is that um, we were seeing whether we could, you know, what support we could offer our community because I'm conscious that um, whilst we've got some of the operators um, on today, quite a lot of people um, are in smaller um, 
or in smaller organizations can't necessarily keep up to date with everything that's going on with the daily um, updates and things. So um, we will send out these slides and also a summary of the topic and we are recording today as well. But um, I just wanted to share some of the stuff that's going on because I don't know whether anybody's shared up to, um, is signed up to the gov.uk website, but you can get daily updates on everything that's changing every day. So I've just put a couple of the links here that I thought people might find useful in terms of a link to the, um, to the self-employment income support scheme if anybody needs to access it, um, business grants and also guidance for transport staff. And that's um, that's particularly in relation to sort of like self um, safe distancing practices and, and things like that. So I thought those would be pretty helpful. But they send out quite a lot of updates every day, and and they're updating people that can sign up to these schemes and new guidance as they find out information. So I I personally find it quite useful because they send out about ten updates a day on all sorts of things, whether it's things to do with your personal life, whether it's new um, new items about um, safe distancing, whether it's things that's happening with the Nightingale Hospital that is being um, that has been opened in or is being opened in London. Um, so it's a useful source of information and although I've only put up the guidance for transport information there is um, for staff there is also one there for construction staff as well if um, if anybody is still involved in working on sites within construction so it is a really useful tool for people to um, to link into I seem to have lost my um, my cursor and I can only go back that's it got it All right um the other thing and marcus please chip in here if you've got anything else that you want to add in um in terms of because i know you've got a lot more information on this but network rail are um if you haven't already seen uh, are putting out a lot of challenges at the moment um the one that they are particularly looking for is in terms of what they can get for ppe so if anybody within our community or you know anybody that um can um can help help with this there's an email um, here that you can link to and you can put in an expression of interest so so now so particularly with this if you've got an innovative idea on how to produce some of this stuff this is the time to innovate and hopefully one of the um, sub um, people that we will have on on a webinar will sort of like um, who's worked in the airline industry during the time of 9-11 will sort of like bring some of that insight into why now is the time to innovate and to offer these top these um these solutions to some of the problems that we're having um, some of you may have also read that um, that the um, that network rail have put out an appeal for um, resources because they're particularly short of um, signalers people who can go out onto the track um, transport planner or timetable planners um, because of um, new ways that they've got to do some of their working methodologies. Southern Region contacted me specifically yesterday so when we send out the summary we'll send you a link on how you can register to their portal and fill out your details and perhaps offer the skills either of yourself individually or your company. That'd be helpful. Can I, sorry, can I just interrupt one second there? I know we have some operators on the line so could I ask them directly is within your businesses are you just focusing now on keeping the trains running or is it are you still doing these process these thought uh, thoughts and uh, changes to bring innovation into the business or is that sort of all paused and it's now just operating the skeleton service Hi, Mark, uh, um, I, I Certainly, as insofar as it goes for um, West Coast, I think that over the last two or three weeks, all of the focus has been on keeping the show on the road, figuring out how do we maintain services for key workers um, at, at this time. And you know, clearly, certainly for among the senior execs, it's been, you know, what does that need to look like with the with the DFT, as, as you'd expect. But the messaging for a lot of the people in the business whose roles may have been largely around projects or delivering committed obligations and things like that it's it's been there's been quite a lot of encouragement to maintain business as usual um, and the uh, I don't there will clearly need to be quite a lot of work to figure out what is the impact on all the programs and the, the projects 
that are committed in our franchise agreement and you know what needs to be retimed what you know what what things may need to change which things may no longer be appropriate and all of that will need to be replanned but that work has barely even started at, at this point um, and i think a lot of people are probably still uh, to the best of their abilities um focused on trying to continue to deliver their projects okay thanks mm. for yeah liam it's, it's mark here at lner um we're actually probably busier than ever to be honest we've got access to frontline staff or well, most of our frontline staff have been stood down apart from drivers and, and train managers so we've got time to go out and test out ideas with them understand their challenges or, or opportunities um it's also a really good time for us to start pushing on pushing on with projects where there's less focus on the day-to-day -day. so actually we're people in my team which is like digital and innovation we're we're busier than ever okay well that's quite encouraging then for the people still trying to push solutions or mm -hmm. create solutions okay is that is that uh, uh, can I ask mark a question please liam uh, mark mark um, do you have um, a list or is anywhere where people can go to understand what your currently your next tranche of projects which haven't been procured are so people can understand what you're after uh not yet but i'm hoping that within one of one of the projects i'm doing at the moment is is around actually surfacing all of these new challenges or opportunities from across the business so i'm hoping i might be able to share some of them some point some point in april i can't put an exact date on it but i should have kind of three or four key priority um ideas right okay well when you do get it can you share it with us can, yeah, we, no can, can we have you down for a future webinar maybe yeah yeah maybe in yeah. april <laughs> <laughs> when this is all over hmm. <laughs> yeah cool, that's fine. all right um, um yeah, i interrupted you johanna Oh. I think for the next oh, webinar, yeah. maybe you should post some Monster Munch to all the attendees so we can try and recreate <laughs> the original. Oh, multi pack here. <laughs> I've got all the flavours. <laughs> um, Johanna, I interrupted you before. I, I, think, I think you must have all the Monster Munch. <laughs> Great. Okay. If you can get us a so, um, online shopping delivery, we'd be most grateful. <laughs> oh yeah, it's true. Right. Okay. So, um, so the other thing I just wanted to update update people on as well um, is um, any of you were suppliers to Network Rail and hadn't yet received the letter. This is um, just a uh, a couple of paragraphs. Um, from the letter that Network Rail have sent out because um, they are conscious that um, they need to keep the supply chain going and also keep people's, um, particularly the SME startup community, keep their cash flow going. So they have committed that providing there is no problems with the payment and that there's been delivery of the service that they procured, they will instantaneously pay their supply chain. Um, and they want to make sure as well, and this is one of the reasons why I'm sharing it with you, is that if you are a subcontractor to somebody who is supplying network rail, they want to make sure that that is going down the chain as well. So they have set up a special um, email so that um, if, um, if anybody is having problems with payments, then you can communicate directly with network rail and let them know because we all know at the moment that um, cash flow is really important to a lot of people because um, we don't know, you know where, where business is going and a lot of projects are either being postponed or, or delayed or, or whatever. So we need to make sure that we are getting paid for the work that we have done. Um, the other thing that um, we might want to debate a little bit about here as well um, on how Rail Innovation Group can help um, is that the only way that um, the government is going to change policy on some of the things that they're doing at the moment and how they can support, um, particularly because I know there's been lots of announcements about how they can support SMEs, how they can support uh, self-employed people and that, but um, there is still a gap in, in some of that support. And I think some startups, which is mainly the community we work within, are feeling a bit more pain than others. So they are really interested to hear from people about 
what problems that they are having is there any way that they can support and again there is an email that can go straight to um the business enterprise and industry um, departments so um, you can either send us your ideas and we can collate them together and send them or you can send send individually to to there so i don't know whether anybody wants to talk about any particular impacts at this stage that um, they have that they want to share with the group that and maybe some maybe some, there's some good news and maybe there's some bad news as well that people can can maybe share yes yeah, so from DKNA's perspective, um, we had a large training program organized with a talk uh, to run through from April to July. Um, and now that's obviously been shifted because um, it was designed as a face-to-face -face, um, program. Um, but my question really is, is, is there still capacity um, within uh, sort of managers' times um, to work from home? and? have access to online training because that's something we're working on at the moment creating online courses around uh, design thinking and innovation management um so just asking the pool of people here is is there capacity and is training uh something that people are interested in during this time hey it's andy from wi-fi spot we've um our directorate have been very keen on this um over the last couple of weeks, we have a large number of online training courses that we go through in our um, ops team and regularly find us new things to learn about so that we're more educated for when we speak to our customers. Um, so, I, yes, as far as online training goes, I think um, there's a, a growing desire for it within not just transport industry, but I think with a lot of industries at the moment. So. Um, the existing um, online training manufacturers um, are already seeing a bit of a boom and an uptake in the, the equipment. Um, I know quite a few people in the training world within public transport and outside of it as well, and they're, they're very busy. Um, I suppose one of the challenges for the rail industry is that a large number of the frontline teams don't generally have access to a company-derived laptop. Um, I know in the past when I worked within the industry uh, within a top um, that we talked about staff having access to training modules through the staff app which could do on their own personal device um, don't know how far that's got so I'm not privy to that anymore but um, I think that's perhaps the the biggest obstruction is getting staff to do online training who don't have a company issued device and I don't know um, whether Mark or um, Tom have got any further that they can add to that regarding what devices staff have got to be able to learn in the manner that the managers are learning. Thanks, Andy. No worries. Um, uh, uh, sorry, Mark, do you want to go ahead? I was just going to quickly answer saying all of our staff have iPhone XRs, um, but no laptops or anything like that in terms of frontline. Well, that's a very decent learning platform as it stands, isn't it? Um, um, a lot of schools these days are pushing out homework learning um, through mobile apps. So I'm sure if our schools can do that for our children, that we can do that for our frontline teams. Sounds like a good opportunity, doesn't it? Yeah. If, if, all front line, if a lot of frontline staff are stood down at the moment. Yeah. Um, I don't know whether anybody's got... Um, children of school age on the call but um, my teenagers use apps um, called show my homework and school gateway where the teachers can push out online learning experiences to them very simply and then there's primary school ones which are um, what's it called class dojo and that's quite it's almost a gamified um, approach for primary school it's very different to the more regimented high school world but the, the stuff out there that's that's quite useful mm. we um we recently ran a online workshop um and it was a mixture of teams for the conversation and then um using an online whiteboard called mural um and that's the sort of collaborative space where people can like, write down on post-its as you would in a workshop setting um and it creates a, that sort of visual um to discuss around 
Um, and we found that worked quite well. And so that's, that's forming the basis of um, our programs at the moment. I was at an NEC showcase last year, might have been the year before in London, and they had um, one of their partners from, from Scandinavia somewhere, I can't remember exactly where, but they had a, a whiteboard roll that they put on the wall and projected to it using NEC projectors. And they could do very much that with, um, like you could write, a, you could tap on this thing and a post-it note would come up. So whoever was presenting could do that and move stuff around. But because it was all digitized and captured immediately, it was coming up on the participant's laptop just around the corner and they could interact and do the same thing. So from a, an L&D perspective where you've got somebody who's used to training in the classroom and being all animated and giving it all of this at the front of the room, it's still a good way to interact. Because um, I think from my experience within talks, one of the challenges that we had when we were trying to push out new technologies into the front line was that the unions and a lot of the front line staff found themselves struggling or found themselves resistant, more to the point, against not having face-to-face -face training in a classroom. Um, I don't know whether that is still a challenge a number of years on from being involved in that aspect of the industry. Or, I'm guessing it would also be talk to talk and um, union group to union group, so to speak. But um, uh, it's certainly something that we as a collaborative world outside or on the cusp of the rail industry should be looking at offering and supporting. Do you, um, Craig, um, I've, I've seen um, you um, sending out links to your online um, design thinking mm. courses on LinkedIn. Um, it, do you think it would be useful if you sent us um, details of that and we could send it out in the newsletter update about this yeah, in absolutely. terms of that? And maybe also, I mean, because obviously you said some quite useful things there, would you like to host a webinar? <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll pass the baton on to David, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we can do that. We can. <laughs> no, I think I think I think it would be interesting to do because I think you said some really interesting things there, and obviously it'll be good, a good showcase to show some of the things that you can do and and spread the word. Because yeah, that's exactly yeah. what this this is meant to do is sort of like help people, you know, with their businesses during this time to repivot and um, reach new people. Absolutely. Thanks. <clears throat> Could I just ask something about repivoting from from what we're doing as an SME? Um, <clears throat> We've, we, um, uh, sorry, I'm Emily and from One Big Circle, uh, the one based in Bristol, um, we created a uh, device that sits inside um, the windscreens of, uh, of any trains or operational vehicles and it collects the line side data. Um, it's literally a, you know, it's an Android phone sized device. And we've been working with Network Rail on, on using that for, um, as I said, kind of line side management, um, uh, and maintenance. We've been working with Transport for Wales on, it, on vegetation management, uh, but in a time when we're looking to kind of repivot and what other solutions we can provide to an industry that's um, got challenges on on many levels, um, the footage that we collect because it's cab based could be used for driver training on particular routes, especially as what it's collecting is is very. Um, you know, we can have a device on on a on a vehicle today, and it be, can be made available online within. Uh, within the hour. So it's very current data. Um, it's from the right viewpoints. And we can also, because uh, we've developed it ourselves, gamify it a little bit, not to the point that this is a whole load of fun, but you can actually annotate it. Um, driver managers could potentially put um, markers on it, a bit like a sort of driver um, awareness test of understanding what the um, uh, kind of um, markers and 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 things need to be sorry I, this is probably I'm, I'm talking very lay person to speak because we come from technology rather than rail so excuse the kind of like um lay person's terminology but i just wondered from yourselves in the industry whether you think this might be something that we you know we could put some effort into to pivot is this is this a solution um when people are under kind of times of of stress that that actually we could help in the driver training world um in in a way that we hadn't previously kind of thought we would be. I don't know if anyone's got any. Would that be like? That. Would that be like more route familiarisation? Yes. Yeah. So because because of what the data is collected, it's instantly available online because we transmit it 
via 4G and then it can be accessed through a browser so there's no kind of proprietary hardware required for it and no software so it's actually can become very easily accessible via kind of a secure login so um, if you've got drivers that can't be out there you can't be in shared cabs whilst there's social distancing going on um, I know it might have to challenge some standards but is there opportunity to train drivers up on on routes and actually give them a lot of fami familiarity in advance of of going onto those routes it's an interesting point i think uh, from my experience of driver training is the key issue is the union position right. um but you know if, if if these rules are in place for more than six months then that makes sense and there's also an opportunity to kind of do a guess the location with what you've got uh, rather than just continuity to actually drive in where things are, where key features, where key risks are. So, you know, like which junction of this, what's, you know, questions around what's the stopping distance at this junction, uh, how far from this bridge to the next signal, rather than the by rope, which they currently do. So there's an opportunity, but if you get that past the unions, um, I don't know. But given everything that you're doing in Wales, I think there's an opportunity to speak to the people there and also the head of digital, somebody on the call who you might want to speak to is called Hayden Sutherland. Um, I, I think um, you two could probably have a useful chat about this. He's a consultant, so he's not going to nick any of your ideas, uh, but he's <laughs> quite close to some people at uh, Transport for Wales who, who have things to he's say He's just about spat this. out a mini cheddar there. <laughs> <laughs> That's because he's planning to steal everybody's ideas. <laughs> Um, I attend at my first part. Tom, Mark, other question. Do you, your talks believe that there will be an issue with route retention for drivers during this? Um... Mark's dropped off, sorry. Uh... Yeah, hi Andy. Yeah, I, I, it, I have to say when Emily was just describing the, um, the products there, it, it is something that's definitely, uh, you know, a risk. Is, mm. the ha it, is the how do we get back to normal after all of this? <clears throat> And you know, without it taking weeks and months to get all of the uh, the crews back up to speed with their with their route knowledge, um, again, I I'm, I'm not close to that area of the business, but I, I certainly feel like it would be a a good thing to be able to propose at least and explore. Yeah, uh, if there's a way to to help to mitigate that. Because it's an interesting point, because I think one of the things that um, and Marcus might want to say more about this is that we don't know how long this is going to last. And this is one of the reasons why we were um, putting up, you know, what does this mean for transport and how do we have to change the way we deliver it? Because if we, you know, given that this could last anything between three and two, three months and two years, we could be going up and down in service levels all the time. So we have to find new ways of running services, delivering services, and being able to ramp up and down all the time. So what are people's thoughts on, on, on how we re-pivot long term, not just, you know, like, because at the moment, we're probably all very much in the, it's a short term thing. You know, it might be two or three months, and then we can go back to normal, but can we? And do we have to? There's also, I, I'm going to point to Chris, who's, on the line from DFT, but what what does the DFTs what what's happening there about this? Are you pausing? Are you pausing investments? Or are you assuming it? Are you assuming it's just going to jump back up afterwards? The same thing. Um, so as far as I know, in terms of investment into this type of thing, it's continuing as normal um, until we're told otherwise by the rest of the government. Uh, I don't know a great deal about this at the minute because I only got back to the country the other day. I only started work on Monday and half of my team has been to the response for this. Um, but as, as far as I know, from the meetings I've had, everything's in terms of investment is continuing as it was. Right. Thanks. Is, is it worth uh, me... Um, oh, sorry, is there somebody else yeah. talking? Yeah, just to say, I think that, um, you know, Joanna's question about can we get back to normal, do, do we want to... There's probably also a big question in my mind about, do we need to? Uh, will, actually, will there actually be the passenger demand in future to support the level of services and, and investments that have been proposed? You know, the number of people who will have used Zoom and other platforms for the first time in the last couple of weeks and may now decide that they don't need to make as, anywhere near as many trips as they have in the future could lead to you know, quite radically different uh, business models for, um, 
for, for train operators. And indeed, um, you know, if that's outside of rail, but clearly I, I can't see international travel um, getting back to normal if there is a normal, you know, any any for a much longer period than domestic travel. And, you know, what does that do in terms of, you know, your mix of customers and the types of services that you need to be offering? Um, you know, weekends and, and, and all of this, there's, there's huge questions that all of this is going to throw up that will take us quite a while to, to, to even identify, let alone figure out the answers to. Mm. Yeah, the concept of modal shift, Tom, aren't you just said it's huge, isn't it? Because people will, will drift away and how do we leverage people out of their cars back onto public transport? Um, but yeah, I think you're right. The business travel market will take a hit because of the piece of technology that we're using now and Google Hangouts and Microsoft Teams, et cetera, et cetera. But as a result, will the leisure market increase because of the amount of staycations that will be um, more prevalent yes. than people going out of the airports? Will this have an impact? Well, certainly. On yeah. I was just going to say, certainly if you want a holiday this summer, it's going to be in the south of England. <laughs> I'm here already. Sunny beach holiday. <laughs> <laughs> no. China's going to rent out rooms. I've, I've, seen, I've seen some um, some information um, or some videos and some comments from the aviation industry um, for the some of the passenger airlines that are still flying. Um, they've taken out every other row of seats on the aircraft so that people can um, social distance. And I think, given the level of um, congestion or the number of people travelling on the rail, particularly commutes into London. Uh, I think that's going to have to be um, really thought about very carefully because it has huge implications. If uh, if one of the examples is actually people don't really change their behaviour, they still want to travel on the trains in the way that they do now, um, and the virus is still around. Uh, the question is, wh what what happens? And I, I I don't know, but I mean, in aviation, it's a lot easier to control people getting onto aircraft mm -hmm. and getting off to off aircraft. But on rail, um, you know, I, I travel on the central line um, frequently. Um, it's it's often rammed, and I think you know that 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 um, congestion is going to have to be considered very carefully going forward. It's potentially a bit easier. When I say a bit easier, it's still very difficult in rail, I would imagine. But for the longer distance talks, where they could potentially impose compulsory reservations, so you, you know exactly who's getting on the train and control the yield. That's going to kill away, the demand but, even more. So, yeah. I wouldn't, I, guys. Yeah. I wouldn't bank on on half of the travel and tourism industry being there in six months. I'm taught, I'm plumbed into a lot of the shut up. Um, um, printer rogue, printer gone rogue. I'm plumbed, I'm plumbed into a lot of travel <laughs> and tourism, especially on. stuff up here and up in Scotland, um, but also across the UK and Europe. I wouldn't expect half the travel and tourism industry to be there. Um, the the non UK stuff, especially, um, they're they're really suffering already, and they're going into life support as we speak. Mm. And when we think about sort of us working from home and how is that going to work, and can people can work from home? I'm thinking employers probably will have to reconsider and have to rearrange things, and maybe there will be a requirement for. You have to avoid peaks, so certain people will work certain times and will travel in different times rather than, as you say, for the airline industry can control it. How can we control it for the rail industry? Maybe we'll just have to, every company has to wait to a certain roster on when their staff will be in the office and will travel in, so not everyone's traveling at the same time. There'll be more arrangements of people working flexibly from home. I think that's probably what's going to come out of this. Yeah. So I, I think there's a lot of interesting stuff in here, and it's it it it. it what we're seeing is we're seeing something happening um, which is going to fundamentally change how the rail industry will operate going forward but what you have across the organizations involved um, is 80 90 percent of them are saying things like well in three months time it's all going to go back to normal whereas you maybe have 10 20 percent of people going no guys this is game over so you have 10 20 percent of people saying all of these innovation strategies that we were thinking about doing in the next 20 years, we now need to do them in the next year because we don't measure anything. We don't understand it. So if you think about how a timetable is built, it's built uh, from the model which understands how people travel. That is now dead and it will be dead for the next two years. So what trains should work, run and why? But when you say that, it's like, well, okay, you know you need to change it, but who in the industry is responsible for that change and gathering the information to make that decision? 
and industry isn't configured to deal with that type of issue. So we've got a period of where the old way of thinking will continue to prevail, but eventually they will, people recognize there aren't any answers there, maybe in three months time, and a new way is required. So from my perspective, there's a huge opportunity now to be looking at what strategies people have for five, 10, 15 years, and working out how that can be done in uh, rapid timescales, particularly as the procurement rules are now not there. So if you have a product which you can show how it will help with COVID, it no longer has to go through the normal procurement channels and be bought the next day for the period of the crisis. So I really think there's a lot of opportunity to say, right, what bit of the original strategy about measuring and changing can I do and how does that relate to COVID? Because then you have a sales proposition uh, that people will have to look at seriously for the next three months. Mm -hmm. So I, I just got to look at how that changes the um, how it fits into the bigger transition that we've got to make uh, to decarbonize the trip, the railway as a whole and to move people away from uh, internal combustion engine cars. At the moment, we're seeing much reduced travel. But um, if people are traveling, they're tending to travel by car. And that's quite interesting. Uh, given the direction that we actually want them to go eventually. So one, one of the other um, th the things that's being discussed again in the aviation industry um, is the fact that there will be two, uh, two, two populations of people uh, going forward. There'll be those who've had COVID-19 and have um, some immunity and those who have not had it. Um, one one of the one of the thoughts that has been going around is is having a uh, an immunity passport um, uh, in some way that that allows people to travel in in the air. Um, so only people who've had the disease will be allowed to travel, and who have immunity. And and some of the tests that are coming through now um, actually test for antibodies. So so that this test that um, everyone's probably heard of which is very fast. Um, it's almost like a urine test type, um, type thing. Um, test very quickly and it tests for antibodies. So if you've got the antibodies, then um, in principle, you um, have some degree of immunity to, uh, to reinfection. But, but the idea is that, and this is why I say, I don't think everyone should just naturally assume that everybody will now be home working forevermore. I think people who've got the who've had the disease, and I and I have a, a large number of my colleagues have, have now come out of 14-day isolation and, and and are now saying they've got immunity. They feel quite comfortable that when the lockdown ends, that they can go out and travel back as as normal. So I think you you need to look at that in in context and not just assume everyone's going to be stuck at home. I think but, personally, but I, if I if I get it. Um, I, I don't know whether I, I might have had it. I don't know. Um, but but if I prove to have my my antibodies, I certainly want to go out. I don't want to stay in the house a, a day longer than I have to. But I guess that that sort of like has a dilemma, though, doesn't it? Because there'll be a lot of people who say wouldn't have had it, have followed all the advice, have self isolated, have stayed at home, and that. What happens when? you can go out and because you wouldn't have automatically have had the test, but you, but you just don't know whether you've had it or not. It, it, it's a challenge because, and it's exactly what people are looking at now in China. So um, the, the lockdown in China is now being slackened and people are allowed to start moving around. Um, what they're now tracking is uh, they're trying to, tr and again, because they're doing so much testing, which is why the government, is under fire for not getting testing um, uh, levels up um, is that they're now testing people who are asymptomatic that means people who are infected but show no symptoms um, to, to find out whether or not they are infecting other people and what's what exactly is going on so I might, the, the, the information that I have from um, one of my sources is that the lockdown as is current is likely to last five or six weeks and at, at the longest and then the government will will feel um required to try and unlock it un slacken the lockdown in some way and then that's when these these questions start to become um pertinent but i think we need you know as an industry we need to start asking those questions now because do we have carriages for people who are in fact who have immunity and yeah. you know ones for 
people who don't you know do we have different platforms do we have you know you you guys stand at one end of the platform you guys stand at the other end of the platform you know i mean these are these are some real questions that i think we, we need to be asking because um what whilst you know innovating new ideas is 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 obviously going to be in the long term what are we going to do in the short term in maybe four weeks time because that, that's really when we need to start thinking about how how, how does this operate how, how do we regulate who who travels on the train and who doesn't yeah because one of the things i know because it's interesting saying about um, the aviation industry because um, a lot of people have been saying on flights are still coming into gatwick and heathrow and people aren't being tested but i was aware because i did some business this year in dubai that um they were taking everybody's temperature as you were um going through dubai and then they were and then if you if you were raised then they were then pulling you aside to actually do a, a covid test on you and that was how they were managing it and i don't know whether there's something that can be done that, that would address some of yeah but i think temperature was one of the first ways that they were I'm doing that my son's nursery at the moment to go in get a temperature test before they're allowed in but the point i'd like to make um is we're staring into a, a crystal ball or a chasm, depending on how you view it. The one certainty I see is the behaviour of us as a nation will change. I don't know how. Um, I don't know what it will do. I just know it will be different. And we have the opportunity now to capitalise on that for our businesses in helping develop the solutions such as Dave was talking about, um, but also around trying to influence it uh, for a better or worse society uh, because people are going to come out of this quite malleable but you've got more used to this online technology so it will change but i can't tell you how but it's an opportunity for us all if we can think how our products fit into managing the current and changing the future right okay i'm aware of the time so i guess the last message for me is having heard everything today if you have any comments or input or anything else drop us an email um, you've all got my email address, we'll share it around and a build from there. Is that good? Sound good? Cool. Yeah, so Thank brilliant. You. Well done. Everyone's got thumbs up. Yeah. Cheers for joining us today. <laughs> Thank See you, everybody. Hope you enjoyed your first munch and learn. <laughs>